Our crew patch was designed by the daughter of one of our crew members, Carol Lind, Don Lind's daughter. Did an excellent job. We were very pleased with it. While Challenger waited out on the pad for us, we were having breakfast. This is the morning breakfast. You notice we carried the motif of the gold and silver team across. The biggest trick about this was eating breakfast with those, with those shirts on and then packing them up and getting them on board the shuttle so we could have them on board for our crew picture. Exiting the uh, quarters, we all marched off to the, uh, to the van, gave our usual happy wave, and uh, we're ready to go out to the bird. Since I was a rookie on board, I was asked to describe the sensation of this liftoff. Uh, we had had an awful lot of training, a couple of years' worth, but nothing fully prepared me for uh, the actual sensation of those main engines starting and then eventually those solids lighting. And I'll tell you, this son of a gun really rattles when it takes off. I kept looking out the window and Bob would say, go back to your instruments. <laughs> so the pilot's job is uh, not to observe, but to monitor and make sure that everything works properly. Uh, after we took off, of course, we had a big roll and uh, something very unique in this picture, in this uh, series of shots, we're going right up the eastern coast of the United States. We'll flash back and forth between this outside of the window shot and the orbiter actually from the ground, but uh, I think it was spectacular. We can see the horizon come up. We're and come up. We're right up the eastern coast. I commented to Bob that we have just gone through some clouds. Those clouds we just went through were at 42,000 feet, so you can tell we were really traveling upward. We had a normal throttle back at about 0.8 Mach uh, to maintain our dynamic pressure. Uh, below our set limit of about 460 feet per second squared, and then we throttled back up to 104 percent. Now, we continue up the eastern shore. That camera, by the way, was mounted at my right shoulder, looking out the window to my right. That was the Chesapeake Bay. You can see the Chesapeake Bay. Potomac River there into the Washington area. Uh, Delaware Bay, Bay, the Sea Isle coming up on Atlantic City to the right of the screen. The next thing you'll see is uh, Long Island. Certainly doesn't take long to get up there at all. There's Long Island coming up on the right side. You can see Manhattan there. We'll go right on out, out the tip of Long Island. See the northern and southern shores out there, the Hamptons. And the next, next thing you see is uh, Cape Cod. And all of this is real time. This is how fast we were going. Actually, pretty slow compared to our actual flight when we got up to 190 miles. Here's Cape Cod there in Boston. This scene always just proves that the world is, world is indeed round. And spectacular. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we carried aboard uh, a couple of deployables in the Getaway Special, which is really a neat, simple, inexpensive way to uh, deploy small satellites. We were, uh, you can see, I think, the can on the, on the new sat opening up there in the picture. Unfortunately, we only batted 500 on these, but uh, given that shortly before flight, uh, we were faced with perhaps not being able to deploy them at all, we thought 500 was really pretty good. And there it goes. That was the new sat for the northern Utah satellite, which will be used to uh, calibrate air traffic radars around the world. When we started down the tunnel, uh, Bob took over the aft flight deck, put the silver team to bed, and this is the rest of the gold team going down into uh, the module to uh, start the various experimental operations down there. It was amazing how quickly we adapted to this sort of locomotion. Well, really, you're flying. 
uh, this is a little bit out of sequence. We didn't get that much fun until about sixth day. What we're doing here is trying to prove in the conservation of angular momentum. That's one of the things I promised my kid to do in the space. <laughs> Well, you know, in this case, this is about my second day, and I uh, wasn't sure whether I was going to like flying or not, so I was looking at another profession of juggling. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you watch closely, I didn't do very well with that, but I sure enjoyed the space flight, so I, I think I'll take the space flight. The angular momentum is conserved when you don't hit your head or anything. <laughs> This was the ultimate uh, fluid dynamics test as far as I was concerned. I was going to do the re replay the Joe Allen test that we took only in 35 millimeter on STS-5. I get a little carried away with uh, the strawberry drink. I uh, get the blob, blob flowing well and I put the straw in it, but I stuffed it, the straw a little too far through and started sucking it down pretty well and then all of a sudden it migrated on me and all over my fingers it happened. <laughs> this is activating the first of the three crystal growth experiments that we had on board. Uh, two of them were to grow mercuric iodide uh, in the vapor phase. This is the most elaborate of those two experiments. Uh, the crystal grows in a little furnace in the, behind the gray door with the yellow, yellow decal on it. Uh, this experiment, we were able to watch the uh, growth of the crystal through the microscope that you see by my shoulder and on the television system. And uh, Ludwig and I spent uh, each shift watching the growth of this crystal. We, uh, our hope is to grow more perfect crystals on orbit than we could uh, under the gravitational stress on the ground so that when these mercuric iodide crystals are used as detectors for x-rays or gamma rays, that uh, the resolution of the x-ray spectrometer is uh, more accurate because the crystals were grown under these ideal conditions. The third experiment was uh, growing uh, triglycerin sulfate crystals in uh, the liquid phase. And this is the transfer of the first test cell in which the first crystal was to be grown. The, uh, had to the uh, fluid uh, from which the crystal was to, to grow had to be heated to a uniform uh, temperature. Uh, so we had to uh, transfer the test cell with uh, the ingredients into a preheat chamber where uh, everything would be brought to thermal equilibrium. And I'm just connecting electrical connectors to that test cell. And after everything came to equilibrium, then it would be transferred to the uh, green uh, enclosure uh, below that cabinet. Uh, where we can monitor the growth of the crystal with various optical systems. Well, this this part is actually the part that I'm starting to work, worry about the DDM. For those of you uh, not aware of it, the drop down X module did not work when we first turned on. For some reason, we still don't know yet. Um, it was a big disappointment to me at the time. Uh, fortunately, there was no exit. Mine might not even come back at that time. Uh, I settled down, start to troubleshooting the system, and with the help of the ground crew and also the support of the flight crew, I was able to get that same system back on track, and we start to operate the system again. And uh, I have to apologize to the rest of the flight crew. When I first turned on after I repaired, and I let out such a loud yell and woke up everybody, <laughs> even started the people in the flight deck. And this is sort of sequence which you will see when the drops dynamic system is working properly. You can see what we're looking at the rotation of the droplets in a controlled manner. Um, we can see essential equilibrium shape eventually lead to so-called saddle point and fission, which you didn't follow through. This was one of a series of uh, experiments that were intended to primarily look at effects on the nervous system. Unfortunately, the first few days were so busy I did not have time to even touch this. And so, uh, nevertheless, this is what it looks like. It's eye-hand tracking. And, uh, and really, there's no weightlessness itself produces, uh, as far as we can tell, no real shifts between the two. Why'd you give up? Right. <laughs> and, uh, <yeah. laughs> well, this is about, as you have all seen in the previous scenes, that uh, Don Lind was installing those crystal growth cells. It was my primary job to actually activate and uh, pursue the, the crystal growth itself. What you see here in these scenes is a part of the way we could follow the growth of the crystal, is by an optical system inside the rack. And what you see that back that big black blob there in front of the crystal is uh, part of the optical system. On the right here is the 
uh, RAF, the Research Animal Holding Facility, which is a fancy name for an animal cage in space. And here is uh, one of our friends, and they, uh, if anything, became far more friendly in space than they had been on Earth. I apologize for this. The, the, uh, cage windows uh, were impossible to properly clean and such, but they maintained uh, their same inquisitiveness. Uh, he, that actually, that bit of food actually came from above and he grabbed at it, <laughs> but they're firmly behind plexiglass there. This is uh, one of the crystals that we grew from triglycerin sulfate. Uh, we started with a seed crystal about the size of a dime and grew it to about three times the thickness. Uh, my task here was to remove the, the uh, crystal from the end of the sting, which had already been pulled from the solution, so that we could bring the crystal back safely for transport. It's a fairly delicate crystal, and I had been admonished to do this very carefully, so I was doing it slowly so as not to damage the crystal. Once we uh, got the crystal away from the, uh, the sting, we wanted to photograph it, and with the white uh, sterile gloves on, we couldn't uh, do it very well. So we sim simply uh, carefully launched it into space so that Bill could follow with the camera and we could see all the various, various facets. You see it has grown under a couple of different growth conditions in, in various layers above the initial seed crystal. Everybody's always curious about how you sleep in space. Uh, every crew does it a bit differently. We had these uh, sleep stations, which are really like uh, berths, and they work quite well. There weren't nearly the complaints of backache and insomnia that you get on many flights. I was asked to comment on this section. I'm not sure why. I don't know who that bald-headed guy is. <laughs> well, I don't know if you people have noticed yet that beautiful body there on the left-hand side. <laughs> uh, one of the things I was involved in was an, called an AFT experiment, which required lots of physiological monitoring and uh, recording. And so I have the electrodes placed on my body. That's not all of them that you just see superficially. And then we have underwear that we put right over and the underwear contains all the wiring and the connectors that go from the actual electrodes to the recorder that later hangs on a belt on, on our waist. And you see I'm trying to get that stuff on and it's, uh, all the wires are just hanging loose right now, but they all fit somewhere and they all go somewhere, I can guarantee you. <laughs> and uh, that's how we got dressed every morning and undressed every evening. And uh, that was it. Bob and I spent a lot of time taking photographs, but a part of my part, part of my job was to document what went on. I thought you might like to see what the tunnel looked like between the orbiter and the space lab after we had stowed a lot of the trash in it. it looked like kelp kind of floating around. That was my hand, by the way, <laughs> trying to keep me straight. We have a little joggle here where we actually raise up and come into the tunnel, and that gives you a, an excellent view of, this, of the space lab back there. I'm at the other end now, and I'm going to move up, and in just a minute, you'll see how things get passed. All right. That's there it goes. You can see the pen. <laughs> Look at that And that patch. came from Don Lynn all the way to Ludwig at the other end. That's about uh, 20 feet or so. Yeah. Ludwig's working at the workbench there. Right. And you can see how all the wires are now fitted to connectors on my arm and there is nothing, not much hanging loose from, you know, that white underwear that I wear. I worked in my t-shirt, as you can see. I hope you will forgive me for this informality. <laughs> Norm not only slept in the bunk, but in a moment you'll see where he really slept. <laughs> Yeah. It turns out that up by the scientific airlock is a nice little nook or cranny or whatever. And I got up there before Ludwig realized where I was, and I said, hey, Ludwig. And Ludwig says, who said that? <laughs> and it, it took him about five minutes to find out that I was up there. It looked like a moray eel coming out of there. <laughs> this is the aurora, the northern, or in this case, the southern lights. Uh, this is really one of the spectacular views uh, of a natural occurrence on Earth. Uh, to see the whole uh, sky illuminated uh, below us against the, uh, the moonlit clouds was really spectacular. This goes from horizon to horizon. The uh, atmosphere is uh, bombarded with electrons coming in from the magnetosphere uh, and currents surging through the ionosphere cause the air particles to glow. 
This is in, uh, taken with a black and white television camera for sensitivity, but to see this in, in full color was really spectacular. Plasma instabilities in, in the plasma caused the, the motion. Bob took 35 millimeter pictures to document the color because the, the various color tells us the particular particle that's emitting light. The red shows a particular transition in atomic oxygen. Uh, the green, uh, a different transition. Well, this was deactivation. At long last, although we were having such a good time, we had to come home, so we battened down the lab, prepared it for entry, and this is closing out the airlock hatch that goes back into the space lab just prior to getting ready to start the uh, deorbit procedures. Everybody strapped into their seats. This is the last experience that uh, Taylor was going to have to get with zero gravity there as playing with the uh, amplifier box. <coughs> this was one of our displays, the backup flight system on CRT3. Just you can look on that and you see we're counting down to uh, entry interface and uh, it was a very relaxed entry. We, we were uh, absolutely nominal. You notice I had, I kept sitting there with my hand on top of my helmet with essentially nothing better to do but just watch it uh, at least down to Mach 0.9. Yes, except the rest of us didn't know you were doing that or we would have been more worried. <laughs> <laughs> There's what the glow looked like out my window on the left. Uh, uh, we, this is up probably Mach 22, 23 yet. We had done our deorbit burn in uh, nighttime, and so we saw our last spectacular sunrise as we came uh, on our track in towards uh, Edwards Air Force Base. We were still very high. The glow was around us, and all of a sudden the sun started breaking through, and, of course, it washes all that glow away totally because the sunrise is quite spectacular. Bob got the glow. I got the sunrise. <laughs> These are the uh, mission specialists, uh, Norm right to the foreground and down in the background, and then uh, Fred there at his pilot seat. And we're just, uh, we've now moved into daylight. Uh, you can see this, but we're banked over quite a bit uh, at the bank uh, looking at the Earth. It's amazing how at 200,000 feet, after being up at 190 miles, at 200,000 feet flying over the clouds of the Pacific, we thought we were right skimming the tops of them. It just seemed like they were right below us. Uh, it, it's amazing how coming down to that altitude, and here we were a good uh, 140,000 feet above them. We intercepted the uh, heading alignment circle at point nine. We had really nothing uh, to comment on. The uh, entry was absolutely nominal. We, we'd picked out the lake bed way out, out over the Pacific. Fred had called that he could see a, he had a visual on uh, Edwards when we were well a couple hundred miles off of Los Angeles. We passed over Los Angeles and then on into uh, the heading alignment circle. Uh, we picked up all of the, the visual aids. The guidance was right on. Houston had assured me several times that guidance was showing us right on track. Fred named, made the normal calls that we have trained so much in the standardization of all the cr flight crews, the pilots making the calls and the commander flying here. And as we come on down, we at 400 feet, we lowered the gear. I'm sure Fred lowered the gear without even me calling it. <laughs> and uh, we came on down to touchdown. Bob, I want to just say that this was one of the most superb touchdowns I've ever had in my life. We didn't even know we were on the ground. Well, we, we uh, rolled for a while there and got the speed brakes to come out and start the derotation down. Uh, and got on the brakes at this at that time after derotation in accordance with our test plan and uh, brought it to a stop. Uh, I've got a couple of pictures that I'm very proud of that uh, uh, for test pilots it doesn't make a lot of difference where you land but it's where you stop it and we stopped it right on center line and we made darn sure we got it stopped right on center line. We felt very uh, comfortable. I don't think any of us had uh, a much deconditioning uh, experience to go through. We were obviously feeling heavier, but we walked very steadily and, uh, and had no difficulties with it at all. We uh, did not want to make a walk around because I had been doing some braking, uh, heavy braking intentionally as part of the testing and uh, did not want to walk around in case the tires had gotten hot. Uh, again, that was the, uh, the flight of 51 Bravo, Space Lab 3.